Dr. Knuth, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So just today, Dr. Mounts showed me a video that was released. Was it last night on TMZ? Is that what you said, Tim? Yes, last night. Brand new TMZ UFO documentary. I believe this premiered on Tubi, T-U-B-I. Okay. And tell us a little bit about what, what is in this video and where it came from. So I'm going to set this up, and this is courtesy of Jeremy Corbell, and I believe the documentary is called UFO Revolution. And ap apparently this is over a Iraq in October 2018, a joint military operations base. And I'm going to just pull it up now and let everybody see this. This is known as the jellyfish UFO, and once you see it, we'll know why. And this is breaking as of last night, courtesy of Jeremy Corbell. And if you're listening on our audio version, we are seeing what looks like a big gelatinous, maybe blob, jellyfish-type looking thing moving across the sky. It almost looks like like a bad older movie with with terrible graphics is kind of what I get from this video. But you can tell that it's going over what seems to be some type of, of military facility or war zone floating through the air, hovering with seemingly no form of propulsion. Right. And interestingly, they say that this jellyfish UFO was observed for about 17 minutes and then it went into the water. Unfortunately, there's no video of this incident. It stayed under the water at some point till it reemerged and shot off at an extreme rate of speed beyond the optical scope of the observation platform. It says it's officially classified as UAP. It's a intent capability are unknown. Some additional details here. As I said, it displayed transmedium capability, so it went from air to water and back out, and then exhibited controlled descent and ascent out of the water. The UAP displayed low observability, and, and Kevin, this is what I found super interesting, and it reminded me of, of you. We've seen you in a tear in the sky. The UAP was not visible with night vision and appeared to jam the targeting capability of the optical platform. Now, when you were on a Terran sky, y'all filmed something in the sky that you could see on one camera, but you could not see on another. Yeah, so let's happened. get all your thoughts on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, all right. Lots of thoughts. So I'll answer the most recent question, which was the on the Terran in the sky. And that was when the um, Catalina Island team uh, Michael Hall and David Altman had spotted an object and alerted us in Laguna Beach. Um, and Jeremy McGowan and Jason Turner took off in Jeremy McGowan's Osiris, which is his mobile unit. Um, and they headed up the coast to try to try to find this object. And um, later it, it was revealed that the object that was seen by the team in Catalina was the International Space Station. Um, but um, Jeremy McGowan and, and Jason Turner when the Osiris had w found another object, um, which was probably a different object because of the, this effect, um, where it was <clears throat> visible in one of the two cameras. So we had a fisheye camera that could, you know, have a wide field of view. And then there was a um, pan zoom tilt camera that could focus and aim at an object and, and look at it. And this was all in the UFO DAP system that was mounted on Jeremy's Osiris. And the um, the object, the light was was visible in one camera, but not the other. And this was, you know, this was recorded by the the documentary crew. Also recorded this while in, you know while it was happening. So so it was rather confusing. And what you know, I think we later determined was that one of the cameras had more capabilities in the infrared region of the of the spectrum than the other camera 
And so the, this object was probably visible in the infrared light, but not in visible light. And, I, and from what I gather of looking at the imagery here, the fact that it's changing, um, changing from being a light, a light object to a dark object, depending on background and such, um, that look, it looks like that's an infrared image is what, what's being, um, what was recorded in the, in the case in Iraq with the jellyfish object. So let me ask you first, before we dive into just the physics of what we're seeing here, what would you say about the legitimacy of this actual video upon seeing it? Did you think, yes, this is real and something that could exist? That's really hard to say. And this is one of the problems of, um, data coming out of the military and the, and, and because we don't know what the providence of the, of the imagery is, we don't know all of the details usually of the events surrounding the encounter. We don't know everything about the equipment that was used to record the imagery. And so it's very hard to assess uh, what's, what's going on here. And in fact, you know, there has to be some concern of the potential for disinformation because we're dealing with um, the, you know, the U.S. government, which has kept these things quiet for 80 years, and is now, you know, it's now there's now discussions going on with the Inspector General about this. So we know that this has been kept quiet for 80 years, and so, and they haven't been forthcoming. And it's not clear whether you can trust the things that are being released by them. Um, this is one reason why having scientists out there. Um, recording data with multiple, multiple instruments, multiple types of instruments is is the best way to to approach such a problem. So, assuming that it is legitimate, we'll take all of the other stuff aside. Right? Could be government disinformation. Could be anybody's government disinformation. Um, assuming that it is truly something that existed that we have caught on camera, what was your initial thought upon seeing it? My, my initial thought when I when I first saw this, I thought, well, <clears throat> it really looks like something on the camera lens, or if there's a dome covering the lens, it could be something on the dome. However, if you watch watch it carefully, you know, throughout the course of the video, you'll see that there's a point where the camera zooms out, right, and the object becomes smaller. And um, if it, if it was you know, schmutz or some dirt on the camera lens or dome, then that would have become, wouldn't have become smaller, it would have become blurrier, right? It would have blurred because you would have gone out of focus and, or changed the focus on that part of the camera. So so I, I don't think that this is something that's on the camera dome or on the camera lens. And I'm sure there's going to be skeptics that suggest that. And that's clearly wrong because of the zooming effect. Um, also, the 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 position of the object changes with respect to the, the reticle. And, and so it's clearly moving around um, and being tracked. And so, so it, you know, on, at, you know, the best we can do at this point is to, I, I, the best thing I can do is say that it looks like it's an actual object moving across the, you know, the visual field. Um, so. Great. And for those of you that are just sure interesting. Us, I mean, it looks it a lot is. like. It reminds me of the um, Imperial probe droid from Empire Strikes Back on Hoth. <laughs> I, mean, I was watching it, and I, in my mind, I've got running the sound, beep, 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 you know, the sound <laughs> that, it, that the probe droid makes. <laughs> that's running yeah. through my mind when I was first watching this, because that's what it looks kind of like. Um, and I hate, well, to, and make, of course, I hate to make a connection the... between something that's purportedly factual and fictional, but, but that it just really stood out for me. But our brains reach for something that makes sense that we have seen before. Absolutely. Something you're familiar so, with, at least. Yeah. Um, right. So for and those of you just joining us, sorry, we had some technical difficulties going yes. live to Facebook, but we are on now. We are joined by Dr. Kevin Knuth, who is a physicist, and we are diving into the most recent UAP video that was released. We do love our audience interaction. So if anybody has questions, please do write them in all caps so that we know that it is indeed a question and we will do our best to get those into the show. And back to this UAP, as a physicist, can you talk to us at all about the actual physics of what we might be seeing with this object? Yeah, because uh, let me to interject this real quick. Another thing they reported is that this UAP displayed positive 
lift, and of course that it was trans medium. So, what what do you make particularly of those two things? Yeah, it's not obvious how the object is aloft. Um, that's the the first surprise, and that's one that's one of the five observables that the ATIP program um, identified for UAPs is that you have you have positive lift without obvious mechanism. Um, and then the second of the five observables, a, a second one of the five was the um, transmedium capabilities, the capability of going from air to water, water to air. And um, that wasn't recorded on video, but that's reported um, as being associated with this object. So, yeah, so it's, 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 it's extremely interesting. Um, but this is one of those cases where it would have been wonderful to have multiple cameras, multiple types of cameras um, be picking up, you know, looking for electric and magnetic fields, um, measuring, looking at spectra, um, trying to detect other features that would provide us with more information about what's actually going on here, what the physics or engineering of this object is. Yes. Could you tell us what do they mean by positive lift? Oh, positive lift means that the thing is basically lifted up in the air or basically held aloft, you know, so like like an airplane or a helicopter or a balloon, something like that. Those all experience positive lift. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the droid. You know, when I first showed this to CJ, she pondered about the old story about Russian military forces, you know, constructing like Iron Man type of warriors. And when I showed it to our military consultant, he said, you know, it reminds him of an Iron Man suit, you know, but then I wondered, wow, well, who would actually get in such a suit and fly it over an active military zone? <laughs> but, you know, I, I find it really <laughs> frustrating. I, I, I'm sure you do too, that we have so much data that are missing, like supposedly it went in the water. Well, where is that? You know, like what was the altitude? I mean, what, how big is this? And the same thing about the orbs do, you know, do we have any way of figuring out how big such an object is or, you know, just some fill in the gaps of some things that are missing. Yeah, no, that data is, is either um, not available or withheld. That's what. Uh, that's another problem with mil these military releases. Um, the imagery that's often um, released is, you know, according to the either pilot descriptions, especially in the case of the 2004 Nimitz encounter, or you know, or whoever was describing this event. Um, the imagery that gets released is the most boring part of the encounter. Um, they never release <laughs> right. the exciting stuff. We don't get to see the object taking off at, you know, at, at um, you know, like a bullet out of a gun or, or diving into the water and then coming out at, you know, extremely fast. We don't ever get to see these things. And, you know, and whether that's been recorded or not, you don't actually know that doesn't get released either. So, so. And this is another reason why you can't help, as a scientist, you can't help but be suspicious of the, the military and their intentions because, or not the military, but the government and their intentions, because we're only being allowed to see the most boring videos of these things. And that really doesn't help, um, from my perspective as a scientist, that doesn't help my job because it doesn't convince my fellow scientists that anything unusual is going on. Um, you don't have any evidence that there's anything unusual going on. And then that's a bit of a problem. So that's a great segue, unless Tim, you had anything you wanted to, anything else you wanted to dive into with this UAP? No, but Kevin, did you have any final thoughts on, and I'll put it back up here real quick for those that might've missed it. Did you have any final thoughts on the jellyfish you will fill? Yeah, I mean, at this part of the video looks it looks rather strange. I mean, well, it's difficult to interpret an infrared video, and so this is an infrared apparently, and um, because you can't see structures on the object, and it gets and it's blurred, and these are all the complaints, you know. And this is when when the three videos were released earlier, you know, from the Nimitz two thousand four event, the gimbal and the uh, go fast videos, you know, skeptics and scientists all complained. 
Oh, they're all blurry. Well, of course they're blurry. It's an infrared video. It's going to be blurry. <laughs> you don't have right. you don't have this kind of detail in an infrared video. And so, and it was surprising to hear scientists say this because it made me want to <laughs> slap on. <laughs> <laughs> say, have you ever seen an infrared image? I mean, do you have any experience with this? Because they're blurry. They're going to be blurry. It's it's heat. Yeah. You're heating up the air around the object. That's that ob that air is also going to radiate. It's going to blur the image. Yeah, you get blurry images. That happens, and that happens mm -hmm. with other imagery of UFOs too. Photographs that people take in the visible range. There's often blurry, and when you, and that's a, that's a common complaint that you hear among scientists. But when you dive into the topic and you really study these images closely, you start to realize, well, there's reasons why this is blurry. There's a lot going on here. There's actually a lot of physics going on here, which is interesting, um, which is leading to this being blurry. Um, a lot of these objects appear to have some kind of, appear to be ionizing the air and creating some kind of plasma sheath around the object. So that helps, that blurs the object. Um, some of them are clearly distorting the background um, in the Aguadilla case uh, where you had the the several foot long sized football shaped objects fly over the um, the airfield in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. Yes. Um, when it passes over the parking lot, you can see in the background, you can see the lines for the parking spaces get distorted as they get close to the object, not on the object, but close to it. So this object is distorting the background imagery. And why is that happening? We don't know. Um, that's something I would like to try to study at some point, but it would be nice to have multiple videos of this to, to study. Um, you could imagine if the objects, you know, in that case, the object's hot. So if the object's hot, you, it could be heating the air, changing the index of refraction and bending the light that way. Um, another hypothesis has been that these things might be distorting space-time. It could be creating warp oh. bubbles and things. That's been one. And if that's going on, if there's any kind of gravitational distortion, you're also going to bend the light. And so, so these objects do cause optical distortions. That's common. And, and it's not that people just take blurry images of ufos no there's there's actual physics here and we can learn things from the physics i mean and and that's and that's and i find that rather disappointing when i hear scientists say that because it's like as a scientist you should know better this each one of these effects is a clue as to what's going on and you should be using these clues to piece together um, the physics and engineering rather than just you know making blanket statements oh they're all blurry and that's that's ridiculous <laughs>